I think the $100 million question is how you do it. And I think that is something we need to spend more time on. How do we talk about pleasure to young people? The last thing that I suggest that people go into school is they stand up and they go, we're going to talk about pleasure. More people have sex than vote, more people have sex than drive, more pe- you know, we have sex way more often as a society than we recycle, you know, but we have lots of passionate campaigns that speak about these issues. We don't have as many passionate campaigns about sex. And we need to just start by having really simple conversations that will open up uh, the possibility to speak, to speak about sex and sexual pleasure. There are spaces in which girls can be invited to talk about pleasure. I have found that talking about bad stuff is a good place to start because they'll talk about bad stuff. It's okay to talk about uh, when when something was didn't feel good or felt bad or someone did something wrong to you uh, as a way just to start the conversation going and then kind of suggesting that maybe there are some good things that you could talk about. What do you like about your experiences or relationships? And someone has to take the plunge and try it and go first. So what I always do to start my sessions is say, we're going to talk about sex, we're going to talk about bodies, we're going to talk about sexual activity, we're going to talk about pleasure, but what I don't expect in this session is for anybody to share a personal story. And I also say that I won't be sharing any of my own personal experiences. Typically I would say, um, your parents who pay me through their taxes um, are paying me to give you Sex, ed- sex education. I am not here to answer questions about my sex life in order to establish that sort of gap and my space and their understanding of what the relationship was. The most important thing about being a sexual health practitioner is about finding the language that works for you and you have to be comfortable with what you're saying because if you're uncomfortable that's so easily perceived and any embarrassment you have will be picked up on by your client and you will make them embarrassed in turn so every single person I see I say I'm going to ask you a heap of really embarrassing questions don't be embarrassed I do this all day long there's nothing you're going to say that I won't have heard before so as part of asking them about sex I'll ask them just generally you know and how's that going and did you feel like you could ask for this did you feel like you could ask for that we just explore it I don't know if I often use the word pleasure so much as tuning into our bodies and desires I think that's probably how I put it with clients and it would be things like self-touch reading erotica looking at things that they find sexy trying to find out what it is for them that's a turn on and we need to you know get a language that we're comfortable with that we can start using from a young age with children um, and names for things um, that are sayable, you know, and that are permissible. Um, and then we need to be able to introduce um, pleasure from, from that starting point, I think, really. We ask young people, why should you have sex? If you're ready, why should you have sex? Either it's pleasurable or you want to have a baby. And that, and that kick starts that conversation with young people around, well, if you're having sex because you want to and because it's pleasurable, well, how do you ensure that it's pleasurable for both parties? And then it's quite an easy, natural conversation to have when you think about it. I think a lot of people think there's quite big barriers in the way. Um, But then there really isn't. A really nice example of some nurses, some contraception nurses that I worked with, when they're asking when was the last time you had sex or do you have a regular partner or multiple partners, they would just say, and do you enjoy it? was it nice you know and that's really really simple because then the response you get from there allows you to have a conversation and just saying what things do you like who do you like what would you like in a partner and hopefully from there you can develop conversations about sexual pleasure that aren't as frightening as might you know you might initially think so you've got to be subtle about it and you've got to create a relationship with the young people that you're dealing with and respond to their questions and concerns in a way that's effective, which may be, um, I'm passing around some bits of paper, write down some questions. Uh, uh, No, I won't say your names, they go in the hat, I take them out one by one. And therefore nobody's particularly exposed for having asked um, uh, a particular 
question. When I worked in sexual health, you'd be booked and asked to do something on a particular topic. So we'd go in and start on what the adults had asked us or what the policy of that organisation or what the curriculum of that organisation had. But soon the young people were like, yeah, yeah, we know that, Come now we need to ask you the other stuff. Largely to do with pleasure, um, all to do with like t taboo subjects, things that people thought were deviant sexual practices. Suddenly there was a space that you could ask those questions and somebody wasn't going to um, change the subject, somebody was going to engage with those topics. I remember doing a session with Year 7s on periods um, and puberty and somebody asked what masturbation was. So I said that masturbation tends to be when somebody would stimulate their own body, particularly their genitals, um, in a way that felt nice to them um, and kind of carried on, you know. Um, but then, and these are 11 and 12 year old girls, right? But then afterwards, when one of the teachers was seeing me out of the school, she was like, are you allowed to talk about masturbation to 11, 12 year olds? And I said, well, I was asked the question, so I, you know, it's more responsible to respond to that than, than I think it is um, to, to ignore it. We ask young people, why should you have sex? If you're ready, why should you have sex? Either it's pleasurable or you want to have a baby. And that, and that kick starts that conversation with young people around, well, if you're having sex because you want to and because it's pleasurable, well, how do you ensure that it's pleasurable for both parties? And then it's quite an easy, natural conversation to have when you think about it. I think a lot of people think there's quite big barriers in the way. Um, but then there really isn't. A really nice example of some nurses, some contraception nurses that I worked with, when they're asking when was the last time you had sex or do you have a regular partner or multiple partners, they would just say, and do you enjoy it? was it nice you know and that's really really simple because then the response you get from there allows you to have a conversation and just saying what things do you like who do you like what would you like in a partner and hopefully from there you can develop conversations about sexual pleasure that aren't as frightening as you might you know you might initially think so there's a clip available on youtube um by Betty Dodson, who did a lot of work with women in New York around masturbating around the clitoris, um, about orgasm. And that, she draws the clitoris and she draws the internal structure of the clitoris. And I think that what, what that allows you to do is to start with the genitals, which tend to be a kind of point of reference for sexual health work. So this is the body, this is the female um, genitals, but just kind of showing how big it is, how it's only there as a pleasure organ, it doesn't have any other function, how it spreads internally and can be stimulated from different parts of the genitals. And I think that that's a really nice resource to show, but it just really does show people how the body is designed for pleasure. Now the idea of the pleasure leaf that we produced was, it was intended for workers to talk um, among themselves and to ha open the discussion around how we might sort of discuss pleasure how we might look at issues of pleasure. So it's about just raising the debate, really. It was about raising the issues so people could, could begin to talk about it. The one that we did today was about a handshake and getting people to uh, negotiate a handshake. Like, let's try something, let's play around with it, let's see what our hands like doing together, you know. In a classroom setting or a therapy room, it can be difficult to do more bodily exercises because that sometimes there are restrictions around what you can do and then you know spoken ones are good and it's also just good to get people using language. Drawing a big body and then starting at the top of the body and working your way down and thinking about what things that we like um, that make us feel good so things like having your hair stroked or um, somebody whispering in your ear or really basic things being kissed on the lips um, and then going down the body um, and then it can become quite sexual or it can stay quite gentle um, and more kind of sensual. Maybe even questioning the line between sexual and other practices so you might want to include sensual things like massage and stuff on there you might want to include you know more erotic stuff that maybe not sexual per se a big long list and then they can put yes no maybe whether they'd like to do that thing um, so you know it starts to expand the, the sexual imagination and it also starts to get thinking about consent and what people you know, consent to or not. And some of the best work is um, uh, pairing people with phones and they sit back to back in the classroom and they have the conversation with each other 
and then they're not face to face so they're not reading the body language and they've got to do it through the words and then that makes them think and concentrate and where you've got a trusting group you can really feel everybody move forward in their understanding and their confidence in the area. But I also use um, artwork quite a lot so I get people making collages um, or models about their sexual experience. You know, you can maybe model a, a positive one and a negative one. One way I've done that is with LGBT uh, young people. So they, they model how they feel in their sexuality when they're in an LGBT space versus in everyday life. So they create two models. It could be Lego, plasticine, a collage. And it would take maybe 20 minutes to make the two models. And then we'd have about 40 minutes for discussing the differences between the two models, you know. I remember doing um, a session all about condoms. So we were saying, you know, look at the look at the range of condoms that you can get. You can get different sizes. You can get pleasure marks. You can get glow in the dark, etc. And we did like an obstacle course with young people and how to put them on. And it was a really good, you know, fun event. Um, looking at male condoms. Um, and then at the end, the the ones that are always really popular are the glow in the dark condoms, right? Young people get really excited about them. So when we took them out and put them on all these demonstrators and the young people were actually having a feel of them and kind of playing with them, they soon realised that the glow in the dark ones are really thick and actually they can be quite dry. The lube isn't very luby on them. Um, and so they started to realise that actually they're really thick. They're probably going to affect the sensation. Um, and they kind of then thought that whilst they're novel and they're quite quirky to have, um, they probably wouldn't want a thicker condom. They wanted different types of condoms. So they kind of started to talk about pleasure um, in that session. SPARC is um, it's a, an acronym for Sexualization Protest Action Resistance Knowledge, and it's an intergenerational movement building organization uh, for women and girls to work together to challenge the sexualization of girls. Um, and we engage in, in a lot of different kinds of social change practices with girls. We train them to be activists, and then we work with them and have had enormous uh, response and success. Seventeen Magazine no longer photoshops girls' faces or bodies. That was a petition that we put up um, with one of our girls. These signs, they are for sex positive. And basically, uh, there was a campaign where we were thinking of sex in a more positive light because it's viewed as quite negative and we wanted people to be positive about it, talk openly and not be embarrassed about it all. And people don't want to talk about it because they think, oh, it's sex, and they think, oh, it's rude or oh, it's not really a good time to talk about it. So we want people to be more open about it and share their views. So when people are doing that, you also learn new things, information, and you can get help if you have any problems or questions about it. I mean, young people these days, they are promoted as being promiscuous, not being careful, and that's what the sex positive campaign's all about, really. I think it means being more open and more positive and really being healthy and staying safe. Maybe the most important thing is wanting to hear the answer to your question and being ready to hear about desire and everything that goes along with it, which is often pleasure, but it's often really bad stuff too. So that you're able to really open yourself to listening and hearing about something that might be very different than anything you've ever heard before. Uh, having your own agenda, believe it or not, in this kind of situation is not gonna be particularly useful and will get in the way. So the question you have to ask yourself all the time is, what am I not hearing? If somebody was in sexual health but wasn't confident enough to do it, I would suggest shadowing me or somebody else that delivers sexual pleasure work. I would suggest accessing some training or kind of familiarisation with some resources. Um, I'd look at some worst case scenarios. So what is the worst thing that is going to happen? You're going to go bright red, you're going to get embarrassed, they're going to call your names. And why is that so bad? I train professionals who work with young people, so I train social workers, teachers, youth workers, um, voluntary sector workers, um, and actually break down the terminology of sex as well. What does sex mean? What, what acts are included in that? What acts are excluded? And then um, moving on from that, we'll 
the whole afternoon's around pleasure and how to be sex positive. Because I do sexual health all day long, it's really easy for me, I think. And I, and I get that, you know, just come and spend some time in a sexual health clinic. See the kind of things that we ask people. See how people aren't absolutely abhorrent of your question if you've set it in the correct context and see what a difference you can make if you just make a bit of an effort. I think it's valid for, for people who are working in sexual health to say I'm not confident. What we then need to do is to move on, is to shadow with each other, to access training, to look through the resources and it will have positive outcomes and everybody loves a positive outcome.